And we're back with Phil Hagen on Logstash. Phil Hagen started his security career while attending the Air Force Academy, but later shifted to a government contractor providing technical services for exotic IT security projects. I read that as erotic first. <laughs> <laughs> no, not those. <laughs> exotic erotic, yeah, you know. Uh, most recently, Phil formed Lose Technology Consulting LLC, where he performs forensic casework and information security training, including the creation of a new SANS course, Forensics FOR 572 Advanced Network Forensics and Analysis. Welcome, Phil, to the show. Thank you very much. Glad to be here, guys. It's nice to have you on. And I'm very, very interested in your – you created a project called Logstash. Is that correct? Um, I'm actually uh, not the creator. Uh, that uh, credit goes to a guy named Jordan Sassel. Um, I've, I've got a few links to some, some of his material. Mm -hmm. um, but I uh, definitely think that we've got a couple of really unique novel applications of his tool and, and the work that he and his uh, core group of developers have done uh, to really – bring it into a whole new domain in the information security side. Um, it was kind cool. of, it's very rare that a, a, a new tool or something uh, really just gets my light bulb blown at a, a you know 100 watts, but mm -hmm. um, this really gave me a lot of good ideas, and I think it's got a, a huge amount of promise. Awesome. So tell us a little bit about Logstash, and then uh, we'll dive into some applications of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, Logstash was designed, um, like I said, by Jordan Sassel. Uh, he works for a very large web hosting company. Uh, they needed a way to ingest and handle tens of thousands of log events per second in real time. Sounds like when I worked for a university. <laughs> Um, I think that uh, there was some of that uh, in his background, but uh, he was at a. Uh, they were taking a lot of Apache logs. Was his primary yep. um, in primary goal, and uh, saw that there were some tools out there. I mean, it, it would be silly not to mention tools like Splunk, or uh, when it comes to just logging and, and sim type tools in general, like ArcSight and some of the others. Um, but he saw that there was either a limitation in the technology, um, whether it be how much log amount you can ingest and what the cost is, or the flexibility. Uh, it was either impossible or very difficult for you to modify uh, the way that these tools are handling their data in, uh, in a manner that's going to meet business objectives. Uh, so he said, hey, what the heck, let's just do this ourselves. And, uh, and took the those requirements and put them all into this tool and, and released it some time ago but it's really starting to gain a lot of momentum and a lot of steam in the devops community um, and my my hope is to see uh, the forensic community take that on as well i think that there's a like i said just a lot of potential very cool i'm sorry so from this point on it's your it's your show phil so uh, okay excellent um continue well, on I, we want to hear all about it and uh, some applications yeah, definitely. Um, well, one of the things that, that we've always done is uh, in the network community, the network forensic community, uh, you know, people say, oh, yeah, I, I can do Wireshark, I can do TCP dump, uh, I know PCAP. And for a very long period of time, that certainly was the, uh, you know, the, the critical mass of network forensics. Well, the problem with using that approach is you have approximately a millisecond in order to create that evidence in order to acquire that evidence and if you do not catch that while it flies across the wire it's gone um, so your your evidence uh, your evidentiary procedures have to expand and that's where a lot of these different logging sources came into play uh, what we try to impress upon folks and one of the things we like to stress uh, just is the investigative mindset there's a lot of different vantage points on the network and the, these vantage points all touch or handle a transaction a network transaction in some way whether it's a proxy server that's actually uh, uh, taking that, that connection and intercepting it and doing something on behalf of the user or it might just be a router or some other kind of a switching device or something like that that's facilitating the transaction. Um, they all have a unique and valuable vantage point on that network event uh, and often log when it comes to that. Certainly we talk about firewalls. I'm hearing Bill talk about the stuff with uh, the great history of Linux firewalling. I'm I have a bumper sticker on my car that says IP tables is my co-pilot, so I absolutely love the uh, nice. the perspective he's got there. Um, but those all certainly generate log events, and, and there's a lot more as well. Even if it's just a uh, an email login attempt, for example, that the, the fact that that occurred comes with some very valuable data. Where did it come from? Of course, what was the time? And uh, we want to expand folks' perspective to include 
those other sources because we want to create this comprehensive understanding of what occurred during an incident and during or, or during an event. Um, now the downside on that uh, when you're in an incident response capacity is there's just a ton of different uh, log data that might be stored in dozens or even hundreds of locations across the environment. Uh, you've got to go get it, you've got to bring it back, and then you've got to put it in one place. And that certainly became a huge uh, workload for the insert responders to do, and that all has to happen before they can even use the first analytic brain cell and figuring out what the heck happened. Well, there's been a lot of, uh, certainly a long-standing uh, history of utilities such as uh, the Unix syslog daemon and, and its variants that are more common today, they can send these uh, these types of events in near real time. Uh, they can send them to other locations. And that allows us to at least aggregate them in one place. Well, that eliminates one of our problems, brings in another one. You've got a ton of data to deal with. And when you finally do get these many gigs or, or now even uh, you know, hundreds of gigs of log data, You've got to analyze it. You've got to identify what the formatting is. How are you going to how are you going to make this useful? Um, that's where I think uh, Logstash comes into play. And there, like I said, there are certainly other uh, competitors in the space, commercial tools like I mentioned with um, ArcSight and Splunk. Um, but also there's a, a great utility out there called ELSA, uh, which is the Enterprise Log Search and Archive. Um, it's uh, developed by someone who now works at Mandiant, so it has a very incident response flavor to it. Um, and I think that that kind of competition is very good. Uh, I've decided to focus on Logstash because there's a couple of features that it provides that I think are real killer killer features and I think that it just opens up the world to a lot of different opportunities. Uh, I don't want to go into a whole lot about um, the history and, and, and some of the, the background on Logstash because I think Jordan does a much better job of that. Um, there's a, a video on uh, YouTube from PuppetConf that I have uh, linked and uh, you can check that out. It's a, about a half an hour video and it, he does a much better job of course than I would. But what I want to stress is that Logstash itself is an application uh, that is just an ingester. Um, it is not going to replace your syslog necessarily. Uh, you can't have it do that. It's not going to uh, replace your uh, uh, your database that you're sending your log events to for long time archival. Um, although I suppose it could if you wanted it to. Um, it's simply receiving data from a variety of sources, and you can have dozens of different sources, everything from the typical syslog receipt to looking into uh, existing files on a file system to uh, you can even have monitor a Twitter feed, uh, for example. It's very, very pluggable. Um, but it takes all these data sources in, in plain whatever form they come in, and it does the magic with it. It's, it's parsing and it's, uh, it's filtering. And it lets you specify in very, very uh, powerful, powerful language what this data is supposed to look like and what you want to capture from that to be queried later. Um, so we'll step through some of those examples and, uh, and talk about that in, um, in, uh, in just a little bit. Um, a lot of uh, the, the you know, old Unix fans, old Unix users, uh, myself included, uh, really scoff at, at getting away from regular expressions. If you want to do anything, you better be able to spit out a five-page regex. Um, you know, I certainly can appreciate that perspective, but at the same time, uh, Logstash has incorporated a language called Grok, G-R-O-K. And Grok is kind of a, a semantic layer on top of regular expressions. Um, and uh, I'm going to try, let's see if this uh, screen share is going to work or not. Uh, I want to share uh, a capture out of the show notes, and I'm going to zoom that up a little bit. Uh, is this showing up in any reasonable form? Yep, we got it. Are you guys? Yep. Okay, great. I can see it. Um, this is an example of a couple of the way, uh, the uh, the standard formats, the Grok formats that Logstash ships with. Um, so you can see here, I'll highlight the, the simplest one, which is just an integer. It's going to say, uh, I have an optional plus or minus sign followed by one or more digits between zero and nine. Oh, that's, that's pretty straightforward and simple. When you move a little bit further down the road into some things that are more complicated, um, I have uh, IP in here, looks complicated, but it's actually pretty simple. And what you're, uh, what you're seeing here is a IPv6 or IPv4 
um, IP address specification. Um, but they have they have really basic things like just show me a word, show me anything that's not white space. Uh, here's how a standard uh, UUID or GUID looks. A MAC address. Well, the MAC address is pretty simple. We're talking about six hex octets, and that's exactly what this thing is is specifying: six hex octets separated by uh, the colon character. So you can get a pretty good feel for what's going on, but you don't have to remember this portion of that grok filter, you just have to remember that that's called a common MAC. Um, build it once, repeat it many times, and certainly when it comes to an incident response or a forensic environment, that's really, really important. Um, you know, you want to be able to do things the same way a hundred times, and you want to be able to do that in a, a, a very fast manner, especially when you're dealing with this much log information coming in. Um, so, let's see. So that's the grok, uh, the, the core key part of, of Logstash, I think, which is the filters and the, the grok, grok formatting. It. I grok it. <laughs> um, you can also nest them. Uh, so you can include, for example, an IP address in another format and just use that higher layer uh, uh, broad format if you want. Um, but the, the overall syntax that you use when you're matching is equally simple. Um, uh, you know what? I should not have unshared. Let me jump back in. I'm sorry about that. It's all right. I'm just glad it's working. I'm amazed it's working too, actually. I have a, I, I have a lucky beer and uh, and my fingers crossed. So we'll just keep that going. All about the beer. What kind of beer are you drinking, Phil? I am drinking the hometown uh, Dogfish Head Red and White. Nice. Oh, I'm jealous. I love Dogfish Good Head. Deal. We can't well, get if... it here in Rhode Island anymore. They stopped distributing in Rhode Island. If you could talk to them about that, we'd greatly appreciate <laughs> it. Thanks, Phil. I will uh, I will mention it. Um, that is that is a tough thing for them to do. But I'll tell you what, uh, if you're ever down this way, definitely let me know. I'll be happy to try and hook you guys up with a brewery tour. Oh, we'd love that. Good times. Um, well, what I've got highlighted here is, is the way that you use those syntaxes, those filters. Um, it's pretty basic. You use the percent sign with a curly brace. And you say, I want to match a syntax. You can optionally specify a what we'll call a semantic and optionally convert the type. I'm not going to talk too much about type conversion. I'm going to mainly talk about syntax and semantic because those are real key parts. Um, syntax is just a pattern name. So I'm going to scroll back up to these pattern names. The syntax would be, in this situation, common Mac or uh, word or int or non-neg int. Any of these are going to be the syntax. The semantic is simply what I want to call it. If you want to talk about you know traditional scripting coding type situations, um, the syntax it would be uh, the type, and the semantic is the name, uh, the variable name, and that's that's really about all it boils down to. Um, and then when you're creating these grok statements, I'm going to show a couple of examples in just a minute. Um, I actually. In rereading this today, I, I put a couple of the paragraphs out of order, so that's bad on me. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. The uh, Creating a grok statement can be a real pain. Um, certainly, it can be as difficult or more difficult than red, regular expressions in my mind, because it's all the power of regular expressions with an added layer on top of it. Um, but I've linked a site in the um, in the show notes to the Grok Debugger site. And man, this thing has saved me, I can't even tell you how many hours. It's fantastic. You put in your, your overall syntax uh, that you want to match, your Grok filter. You put in your test data. In about a millisecond, it tells you, yes, this is matches, and here's all the fields that I'm breaking out for you. Um, so this can take a really complex task and break it down into something that's very, very, very simple. Um, when a grok statement does match, when it hits against some kind of input data, um, you can take a whole lot of different actions. Um, you can tag, you can uh, you can add some uh, some some labels, you can add some fields on there. Um, you can do just a ton of, of different things on it. And uh, and I've got a, an, a real excuse me a real world example that I uh, just put together for uh, our course material that we're building for five seven two um, that I think drives the point home really well. What you see here is a series of log entries, syslog entries for uh, the bind name server when I've got query logging turned on. Certainly query logging is a very valuable thing, especially in a, a, a security situation. Um, but let's take this information, this freeform text, a line at a time, and let's make some, uh, derive some instant value out of that. So what I'll say first is I've got a portion of each line that's lined through, that's uh, uh, struck out. 
uh, I have a couple of filters that I use to rip that out uh, of every syslog entry. And it's going to do things like, okay, I know what a syslog date looks like. I know that this is the host name. I know that this is the, uh, the process name that generated the log event. I know that this is the process ID of the uh, running application that created the log event. So I rip all that out and I put that into values that you'll see later. Uh, so what that leaves me with is this chunk right here, starting with the word client on to the very end. And I'm going to keep those sample, exam uh, sample lines up here on the screen. And I want you to uh, take a look down here at the grok statement that I actually used to put into the configuration file. First of all, I say only apply this to syslog data. So I have information coming in off of like a database or, or some other type of stream. Um, it's not going to apply. And I say quite simply look for the word client followed by a space followed by a match uh, called IP or host, and that's going to be valid IP address or, or uh, DNS host names, followed by a hash symbol, followed by another film format, which is going to be a, a positive integer that uh, I know based on this log format indicates the source port that, for this DNS query. And then the word query, I'm going to look for what the uh, the client actually requested. So in the case of this uh, example here, it looks for archive.cs.uu.nl. And then, of course, we have record types and things like that, and I won't, I won't dig too much into there, but what this is going to do is it's going to say, whenever I get some data that matches this format, I want to tag it with, hey, this is a DNS query. Now, at the same time it's doing this, it's assigning all these labels that I've created. So it's assigning the name DNS client to, in this case, this 10.3 IP address. It's assigning DNS source port to this integer right here. That's the 60222. So all these fields that it's breaking out, that it's matching, it's assigning those as, uh, as it finds them. So at this point, what we're going to do here is we're going to... Uh, within Logstash, before it, it hands off that information to a uh, to a destination of any kind, uh, we're going to tag that with got DNS query, and then we're going to continue down the line. Um, now, this can get pretty complicated, uh, not complicated, but complex. Uh, you can do some really creative things by saying, okay, if I have an item that's tagged with DNS query, um, you know, I want to maybe do some uh, uh, statistical accounting of it. I maybe want to discard it if it's for an internal host name. I can do all that kind of stuff, and it's extremely, extremely uh, powerful. I've, uh, I've got a couple of, of good examples that are, I'm still working on that are going to be uh, distributed with a VM in the class. We're just going to give people a VM that's running Logstash and you create a shared folder and dump files there and it's going to ingest them. Um, and we're going to have a good handful of formats pre-built into the system to do that. Um, and then I've got an example uh, uh, with the, the front end against, the, um, against that DNS uh, parsing as well. Um, Let's see, I just want to make sure I'm catching up on my notes here. Oh, good, I'm ahead of where I thought it was. Um, so Logstash, uh, once you put the data in there, um, you know, that's all good and well, but you need to get the data out. Um, you know, something like a Splunk would be pretty useless if it didn't have a pretty front end. Uh, well, certainly the uh, folks behind Logstash did this, uh, notice that. There is an integrated web front end with Logstash, but I really don't recommend it. I, uh, you know, it's, it's adequate. It's not bad by any means, uh, but there is just so many other opportunities for what you can do. Um, I have screenshots in the show notes, and I'm going to bring one of those up. There we go. Uh, it, the one that I like and I've gotten, hand, uh, gotten used to is called Kibana. Um, now, what you'll see here is pretty much looks a lot like you might see if you played around with Splunk. Uh, there's probably not a whole lot of ways to uh, properly represent unstructured data. Uh, you know, this is this is arbitrary data that's coming in. So what you see is your typical timeline histogram across the top here. Um, you can limit your time. You can uh, uh, see the raw messages down below. And I'll show you in just a minute what these raw messages actually contain after they've been parsed. And let me get that sun out of my eyes. There we go. Um, down the, the left-hand side, we're seeing all the fields that are detected. Again, if you've seen Splunk, not unfamiliar here, um, but uh, what you will notice from, uh, well, they're not in the screenshot, but these uh, fields right here, uh, syslog timestamp, syslog program, syslog pid, etc., etc., are all of those grok matches that we just talked about a minute ago. 
So let me back one more up. Uh, here we go. When you click into any one of these events, you're going to get this kind of information right here. Um, it's going to give you every single field that was parsed out and what the value was. And what you're seeing here, uh, the original message was relayed from a Windows system using Snare, which is a syslog client, and it will take the event log items from Windows, forward them off to your syslog infrastructure. Uh, so it lets you unify everything under one umbrella. You don't have to worry about uh, multiple subscriptions if you're dealing with the, the Windows event log type services. Um, and of the eventing 6.0 protocol. What we're seeing here is I've parsed out um, based on the syslog, I'm sorry, the snare separators, uh, I've parsed out that the service control manager is the source of this event item. Uh, the, uh, the ID, the event ID is 7036 and certainly if you've done any uh, type of incident response or, or real digging into um, uh, the Windows side, you, you'll know that that event ID is going to be absolutely critical. And of course the host name, the full uh, data of what the event was, etc. So we just kind of took this whole thing, sliced and diced it according to our custom format, and broke it out into these fields. Um, so you can tell that uh, that makes it much more human readable than the original line was. Um, I'm going to skip over that one from right now because that doesn't really drive too much of a point home given what we just looked at. Uh, but what I also like to say is that Kibana, uh, which is this front end, allows you to export to CSV and it lets you use this kind of dashboard style streaming uh, interface where you can look at things in real time if you're ingesting logs in real time. Um, maybe not so helpful on the incident response side, but being able to export a custom set of fields into a CSV format makes it really easy to dump into a report. Um, so just uh, a, if you look up at the top here, uh, here's my search string. I said, show me anything that's got a named D, uh, I'm sorry, that has the syslog program set to named D, so we're looking at bind. Um, I want to see anybody that uh, has been tagged with we got a DNS query, and I only want to see this one client, 10, 3, 16, 11, and I want to uh, use a timestamp. I want to show only items between, uh, in this case, 2 and 2.30, uh, which is local time. Uh, the query is written in UTC, as it should be. But uh, this is going to let you very, very flexibly segment out your, your incident, segment out your, um, your timeline into what happened during this critical period of time or maybe involving a, a certain critical resource. Uh, there, that one that I just uh, uh, used, I've got the full search specification up top here or in the show notes um, that you'll be able to, to reference if it's something that you want to play around with. Um, but hey, you know, if, if you're in an incident response situation and somebody comes to you and says, this is a command and control host name that we've confirmed, uh, let's find out who requested that. And you can do that extremely, extremely fast. It takes uh, the, the back end search engine that's used by default here is extremely, extremely fast and powerful. Oh, I see that uh, Jordan is in the uh, in the uh, in the chat here. I just opened that window. Hi, Jordan. Good to, uh, good to have you here. Um, hey, Jordan's hey, been extremely Jordan, helpful. Jordan's the developer, correct? That you mentioned yes, earlier. Yes, yes, okay. that's correct. Um, I, uh, that's been obscured by another window the whole time. So I'm sorry that I missed anything that you were saying. Uh, really apologize to us about all that. The time. I think I see some other familiar names there too. Um, Here's another common use case um, that's the last one that I've got for here. Um, what I've done here is I've ingested uh, DHCP logs. Uh, we want to be able to find a particular system. Um, you know, we've identified maybe that uh, this system is uh, responsible for certain activity. Uh, we want to know what host name was allocated, what IP address it was allocated. We're going to use that to do lead generation, uh, maybe look into our uh, um, uh, drawing a blank here, our NetFlow data to see what other, uh, what else that IP address was up to based on this one piece of hardware that we're concerned about, maybe a rogue laptop or, uh, or wireless device. So what I've done here is I've created one that says, show me anything that's a DHCP ACK, which means that the IP address has been allocated by the DHCP server. And uh, we've got the hardware address that's allocated uh, that, that we're interested in. And this is something that I needed just to rule out uh, some noise that was in my input data. So you can ignore that part. Uh, but I specified, just show me the IP address, the host name, and over here, the timestamp. Hey, this is going to be a great thing that I can export to CSV. Uh, just click it, download it, import it, and it's going to be extremely, extremely um, helpful to integrate into an existing timeline of, of any kind. 
Um, and I see in the uh, in the chat someone who's saying it looks very similar to uh, basic types plunk use and. I'm just showing the very introductory part of it. Uh, you know, we do a lot of, pay a lot of attention to some of the more powerful uh, things you can do with with log stash and just log aggregation and analysis in general. Um, and we, we pay a lot of attention to that primarily because we really think that it's important to incorporate those other evidence sources into your, your analysis. You can get really, really crazy with these configs and I, fully intend to do that uh, and and really ex exercise the power that this thing has and deploy that in our VMware image. Um, you know, I just wanted to capture some of the basics on it and say, hey, this is this is a free tool. It's actively developed. It's extremely, extremely flexible. Um, you know, again, I want to thank Jordan for his help in, uh, in getting a couple of things ironed out while we were getting ready for this uh, podcast as well as for the course. Uh, the the developer community is, is very, very strong. Um, you know, I, I think Jordan, excuse Excuse me if I'm uh, paraphrasing this wrong, but uh, a bad newbie experience is considered a bug, and uh, and that's something that you don't see in a lot of open source project products. That's awesome. Yeah, projects. that's something you don't hear from a lot of developers, actually. That's um, very true, and yeah. uh, and it was it was great to see. And they've got a tremendous amount of resources that you can hit before you have to to bother them directly. Uh, you know, that answered 90% of the questions, and they were very uh, very helpful with the other 10%. Um, you know, one of the Phil, things that I'd love uh, to Phil, do with this is, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Where do you live where it's still light out? I am in Delaware. Oh, really? I mean, yes. We just must have all the blinds closed here. <laughs> You said earlier that you were blinded by the sunlight. I was like, oh. Oh, yeah. I happen to be looking out a west window, so it just was peeking through the uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the shutters. Um, that That's all great information. I hope that people go check out uh, the tool. Uh log stash for some reason I always want to say log lash which is like that's different um, is there uh, is there any uh, resources you want to point our listeners to with respect to log stash uh, other than their their project website um, I think that the uh, the link that they have off to the cookbook, which has a whole bunch of very good configuration snippets, um, can help you do kind of a Lego approach to build the right configuration for your requirements. Um, I think that that's a really good one to use. I can't say enough great stuff about that Grok debugger. Uh, it has saved me so many times. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that there are other... There are other communities that are beginning to see the value in this. As I said, DevOps has really adopted this in mass. Uh, when you're talking about tens of thousands of events per second, that's a problem that, uh, from a forensic perspective, we don't have to deal with. So uh, I'm anxious to see uh, how folks can use this outside of its intended use case. And I, I think there's a lot. Very cool. Um, and you are a SANS instructor. So where are you teaching next? Um, I actually don't have any classes on the docket right now. Uh, we are aiming for early 2014 for the first offering on 572. So uh, Rob has me sequestered in, uh, uh, I'm not allowed to leave until 572 is done. But uh, once that's taken care of, uh, we've got a number of courses that will be lined up, both uh, U.S.-based. We're looking at a few on the West Coast, but I don't know that the dates and locations are final. And uh, we've got a, a small handful of international ones trickling in as well. Very cool. Phil, thank you very much for appearing on Paul.com. Absolutely. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. And with that, we'll take a short break, come back, and wrap up the show.